This is going to be a very strange season for me this year, isn't it? I'm going to go to the commentary box without Paul for the first time since 1986. The fans are going to be looking at it very critically. Oh, he's not the same now that uh, Paul's left his side. It won't be the same. Well, alongside me now is Paul Sherwin, and he'll be joining me for the full three weeks as my co-commentator for the first time. He may not recognize his face, but if you've ever watched the Tour de France, you know his distinctive and famous voice. On the right, here comes Hondo. He's a walking, talking part of broadcast history. Well, you're known as the voice of the Tour de France, the voice of cycling. The legend, Phil Liggins. <laughs> Welcome to The Greg Bennett Show. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And today, well, I just have a delightful conversation with a man who's become a good friend. Um, we often have long conversations and I said, well, why don't we just record this one? And he's been on the show, well, almost two years ago, uh, Mr. Phil Liggett, who I'm a huge fan of. He's the only reason I probably have watched cycling events for the last 30 years. And uh just to be able to sit and chat with him as a mate, I thoroughly enjoyed. And in this one, we, we talk a lot about what he's doing in Africa, what he's doing with the Paul Sherwin project um, in building homes and, and schools, and, and just a fascinating conversation. We do talk cycling. We do talk about his projections uh, for the Tour de France this year. And it's just a fun, easygoing conversation. I, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. A little bit of housekeeping before we go on. As always, um, firstly, I just... Thank you for listening. I truly appreciate it. And if you are enjoying these shows, these episodes, I'd love you to share them. Any feedback you want to give me is always appreciated. Uh, guests that you'd like me to talk to or anything else, please let me know. I, I am willing and open to try any suggestions you have. And finally, you can find actually, you can find Phil Liggett on anyquestion.com forward slash Phil. That's anyquestion.com forward slash Phil. And you can ask him questions there. You can also see some of his answers that he's already done. And you can see all the other experts across the platform and listen to their answers and ask them questions as well. So go to anyquestion.com forward slash Phil. All right. Yeah. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. And remember, success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. All right, today I'm joined once again by the voice of cycling. He was last on the show in episode 28, almost two years ago, and that is an episode you really need to go back and, and check out. He truly is the voice of cycling. In fact, the recent documentary film of his life is called exactly that, The Voice of Cycling. This year is the 50th year that he'll be working at the Tour de France, and just what a fantastic achievement that is. Add to that is 14 Olympic Games, and you get an understanding of why he is held in just such high regard. Over the past few years, I've had the privilege to just get to know him a little bit more and work with him and become a friend, and I'm delighted and honoured to have him back on the show. So welcome, and thanks for joining me on The Greg Bennett Show. Phil Liggett, how are you, mate? Greg, I am actually fine, and uh, just taking me back there to June 2020, uh, I'd been days in from South Africa, and that was the last time I arrived at Heathrow Airport nearly two years ago. I haven't been back to that airport. And you're talking to someone who used to go to the airport every Saturday to fly to the States. I know. Um, it's, life has changed over those two years, mate. Yeah, but you just mentioned to me just pre-show that you're heading back to South Africa pretty soon, likely to get, yeah. get back down there. I am almost two years to the day because I came in at the end of May 2020 from South Africa, overstayed my visa because they wouldn't let me out <laughs> with COVID, but they'll, let, they'll forgive me for that. Yeah. And uh, we're going back. Because, as you know, our rhino, Save the Rhino anti-poaching projects mm -hmm. are still very strong there. So we're going back to a game reserve in the Eastern Cape. We're staying out there seven weeks. Um, it'll fly by. And then I'll face up to the Tour de France, which will hopefully, you're right, it'll be my 50th Tour de France. And uh, it starts in Denmark. And, you know, in all my years, I've been invited, but I've never actually ever been to Denmark. Is so. that right? 
Uh, we should put matters to the right, I hope, in July, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic, mate. I, I love the fact that you're able to get back to South Africa, almost have a little bit of a reboot, a disconnect. Has somebody been looking after your house, by the way? Two years, i got a, a feeling that <laughs> the monkeys might have taken over. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. And not the monkeys on this occasion, although we do have a lot, but we call the monkeys the burglars <laughs> and the baboons the muggers. <laughs> And I'll tell you, just about uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, we have a fantastic lady. She runs a little cleaning business in the village, about 30 kilometers from our house, uh, because we're in a very remote corner of the bush. And she's looked after it once a week uh, for two years now. She's been down every Friday. Always sends me a video. She takes me into the toilet, into the shower, <laughs> shows me how immaculate it is, not a spider in sight, and she's just a wonderful, wonderful person. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, about two weeks ago, we got a walk in bed, turned Trisha's phone on, and it was Lizzie. That's her name. <laughs> and Lizzie said, sorry, Mr. Liggett, sorry, Mr. Liggett, the baboons have been. And they'd taken the struts out of every window on three sides of the house. But luckily... Because they're very clever. They know how these things work out. Very unclever to them. They couldn't get the glass out, even though they got the struts off. Lizzie saved our lives. If a baboon ever gets in your house, <laughs> and we individually lock every room inside the house, in case they do get in through one room, they can't get into the others. They, believe me, they trash the place. Because oh. I'm always seeing my neighbours. We call them neighbours. They're miles away. They're always complaining about the baboons. But you know, they are a protected animal, the, the Chakma baboon. They're very clever and they're only one stage down from the human being. So they take some outwitting, I'll tell you. They do know when I'm back. They go, oh God, the old man's back <laughs> because I only look like a gun going to my eyes and they're off like a flash. Uh, but they don't recognize female people. And so they, they actually, Trish had a stand up boxing match with them on the kitchen sink. They, they don't recognize women. Typical male chauvinistic <laughs> baboons. <laughs> I had no idea that's how we were going to start this show, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Neither that, did I. That is fantastic. No, you started. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about baboons and pillaging. I think that's absolutely fantastic. That, I, I did see the documentary just recently, actually. Um, right. That was absolutely phenomenal of your life and times. Phil Liggett, um, the life and times, uh, you know, the voice of cycling, absolutely extraordinary. And that, that house that you've built there on the side yeah. of the river, did you, you built it, right, correct? Not personally, but I did. We had it built with a friend of ours yeah. on site. We, we mapped it out with our feet and a pen and a bit of paper yeah. in the bush on the Christmas Day 2003. Wow. And by 2004, he passed me the keys and said, you better come and see your house. There's the keys. I couldn't believe. We just stood on the, on the deck and cried because it was just a wonderful thing. It's magnificent. We were doing what we did best, and that was live amongst the animals, totally wild. Elephants literally come to our bedroom window. The hippopotamus are just below where we were standing. The leopards walk past at night. I mean, it's not the place to go sunbathing without uh, staying alert, <laughs> but it's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I mean, you've always, you've always been into animals and wildlife. In yeah. fact, that was your passion probably before cycling. Am I correct? Well, I always said, Greg, when I started reporting on bicycle riders, I said, I'm working with animals now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't forget, I was a cyclist too. Um, and we're one step away from the animals. We're strong, tough people and we, we enjoy our sport and our life, but uh, sometimes we act like animals. <laughs> animals are free and mm. the free spirit of the world. And that's what we encourage. And the same with the bike riders. And dare I say the same of the triathletes too. Yeah, well, they're they're one and the same, the same kind of breed, mate. I think so. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I just had um, our good friend, mutual friend, Christian Vandervelde on the show uh, last week. Good. How was he? He was fantastic. Well, we spent the first five to ten minutes, a bit like we're doing right now, talking about animals. Well, we were talking about. Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin, uh, two different <laughs> two different kind of animals. But we spent the first ten minutes of his talking about you guys, and it, uh, and I and I kind of left that going. I got to firstly, I got to catch up with Phil. I just wanted to catch up, and then I was like, well, 
if I'm going to catch up with him, let's just hit the record button and, and catch up over, over you know, the, Delighted, the podcast. Delighted, It's a while um, since I've seen you, mate. We were at the Collins Cup together. That's yeah. my only time out of the UK in two years. Yes. And there we were in Slovakia together. That was Really fun. enjoyed that. That was You fun. know, for me, uh, if we briefly talk about the Collins Cup here, for me it was like turning my clock back nearly 40 years. Hmm. When Mark Allen came up to me on the first morning of breakfast and we hugged each other, it's like we'd never been away. Mm. Haven't seen Mark for over 30 years. Same with all the other athletes, Stadler, everybody that came up. Oh, dear me. That was a really enjoyable few days there. And what a great race too. I think he just nailed it. I think for me, getting through, you know, the COVID times where we're all used to being traveling and seeing each other often. And mm. here we were all brought together. Um, like you said, some people you hadn't seen for 30 years, but it was almost like a reunion of sorts. You know, we all got to uh, meet in the dining halls and hang out. And, and yes, the race was very special and the professional triathlete organization did a, a great job. But Indeed. for us guys and the old guard, it was almost like a, a, a reunion where we were catching up, whether it be Simon Whitfield, Mark Allen, Dave Scott, you know, Norman Stadler, exactly. like you said. It really was a yeah. special time for that. I, I, and for me, it was somewhat of a career highlight just to sit next to you and and call a race, you know. I, I, Thank you for well, that. I know it sounds unusual probably to hear, but it's like, uh, you I know, appreciate it. It, it was a big deal and I was pretty excited about that. <laughs> I enjoyed it immensely. It was a challenge, let's face it. We had 12 different monitors oh. to keep an eye on. With and no audio. Races. Remember that? No the audio, headphones didn't work. Few, few, but, hey, it was a, <laughs> that was a huge uh, a gamble to, mm. to do a TV show like that, at that immensity, mm. which was uh, 12 events going on at the same time, we needed eyes in the back of our heads. And with respect to our co-commentators, it, that was a tough call for them too because they know the sport, mm. uh, but they don't know the inte- the uh, the complications of a television as technically difficult oh, as that. That was amazing. Anyway, we got by and the reports were great. So. I, it was fantastic. Yeah, Let's but... hope I get back to do it again next year. Oh, it'll be fantastic. Or was it this year? I can't remember. I I think we're into this year now. Oh, my goodness. See, I don't know where I am now because I never leave my home anymore. (laughs) I know. It's all a time warp. It's like trying to just figure where where you are in the world now. It's like, oh, my God. I tell you, throughout my my traveling life, you get up in the middle of the night to go to the loo, as we say, but you can't remember the layout of the room because you weren't in it the previous night. Now I've got no problems. Have you, I'm always in the same house. I can find the loo first time. You go to a hotel and you you, 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 you <laughs> go up the stairs and you turn left and you walk all the way down the hall to your room and go to unlock it and realise, oh, that was where you were last weekend. I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm meant to be well, down the other end of the hallway in a different, you know, room altogether. How many times do you innocently give your room number of, <laughs> as the previous night's room when you're at a restaurant or the bar? Yeah. Uh, not done on, intentionally at all, but numbers just run into themselves. I know. Because, you know, I used to stay in a hotel uh, one third of the year will be in a hotel bed mm. out of 365 days yeah I know. it's it just const- all gone all fell with the axe it'll come back partially but never be the same again no i don't think well ha- on that have you um have you been able to enjoy a little bit of the commentary work from home has there been a comfort a to that yeah. Not the hours I'm getting up because, no. uh, as you know, I work largely for Australian television, mm. American television, um, two opposite time scales there from um, mm. uh, opposite sides of the globe, uh, the, and, and South African TV. And South African TV are two hours ahead of us in the winter. They always start the bike races at five to six o'clock in the morning, and I did some commentaries for them. But for me, I was getting up a quarter past two in the in the night mm. and starting work at three o'clock sharp and doing a four hour commentary. Uh, I'm going. I'm finished at seven fifteen in the morning, uh, which is nine fifteen, a very sociable time of day in Cape Town. Mm. So yeah, it was different, but it's something bizarre. Shouting at the television screen in your kitchen with it being dark out the window, can't uh, you're looking at the kettle within reach but can't quite get it to turn on, and you can't leave your comedy position. And heck, these people are eight thousand kilometres away, and so on. Anyway, it's, it's been a challenge and it's been fun, 
And boy, it's it's pre- the people in television have become really technically very, very fantastic. It's amazing what they've been able to do, isn't it? I was talking to yeah. Christian about that last week, and I know yeah. he's become yeah, a bit Christian's of your sidekick. Christian's off tube, isn't he, as well? He's just done Parry Nice. He's just done Parry Nice, and for yeah. him, with, with young, you know, he's got a couple of daughters, and I think they're almost teenagers. Well, they are teenagers. And, they're uh, fabulous kids. She's too, able to, he's able to stay at home, and he says, you know, it works out well being on the east coast of the US here because he'll get mm. up and he'll call a race between sort of six and nine in the morning or whatever, six and ten in the morning. Yeah, he's finished He's finished and left the studio by 10.30. Well, his studio is his basement. He doesn't even have yes, to go so anywhere. He's, he's even at home now. He's not even he's, going to the studio Yeah, anymore. I think for the Tour yeah. de France he'll go up to uh, Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut, into the yes, studio. Yes, he'll have a studio there. But That's he's not correct. coming over to France. I think he was hoping to go over to France and be in the studios and things over there, but no. they're, they're, they're bringing everything back. The, back the home. last I heard was uh, there'd be no return to the old times. We had a crew of some 80 odd people yeah. on the Tour de France. Now, all we're going to have is a couple of cameras uh, to do little special shots, mm. two reporters on motorbikes, and two commentators. And there'll be nobody else there wow. on the tour. It's- Everybody will be fed, it'll all be fed back into the studios. Mm-hmm. And those boys will be getting into the office at three o'clock in the morning, and they'll go on air around seven o'clock in the morning. For the Tour de France, yeah. But happily, I'll be on, I'll be in France, so I'll be real time. Yeah, and you you do that with Bob Roll. Is he your sidekick? Bob Roll, yeah. yeah. We'll do the commentary. We have two great reporters who will do the talking to the riders and stuff. There's talk of me doing a little bit more Envision stuff to to actually prove I'm actually standing at, <laughs> underneath the Eiffel Tower or on the Arc de Triomphe <laughs> or somewhere in, in the Pyrenees or the Alps. And because they've got to get value for money, you know. Yeah. So I might be doing a, a few hello and welcomes from the venue nice. in Vision, which yeah. I never did when I was normally covering it. Yeah, you'll be presenting more than just uh, commentating. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but think of the money they're saving now. Oh, it's unbelievable. And I don't, I don't think they're suffering either. I think the viewers are getting good value for the money. Well, our viewing figures suggest that there was never a reason to go back again because the last two years have been done from my home, yeah. a studio in Sky Television, West London, while Bob Roll was in Connecticut and Stanford. Yeah. And uh, they have been get, they've had the two biggest viewing figures in the last decade. Is that right? Consecutively. Wow. So why spend the extra millions oh, yeah. and, and, and lose your half your viewers? Mm. So it doesn't make sense. It's incredible how... And I'm glad they're putting me back over there. No, I know, because there is something about being there and the, the, the smell, the taste, the... You look out, you can... You know, if it's yes. raining, you're there and you can sense the trepidation. Yes. You, you, you it's have always a, nice to be freezing cold like the riders, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. remember, that's how we were in Slovakia. Remember how cold that suddenly got and we're all freezing sitting outside yes, in that I, booth. I regretted not taking the, the, the umbrella from the hotel. It was quite a walk to where we were commentating. <laughs> there was no way I could run back for one, put it that way. Yeah. That was a mistake. Yeah. Just shifting gear a little bit. Um, how's the response been so far for your documentary film, which was extraordinary, by the way. I absolutely loved it. I know it's out in Australia and Canada and I believe the UK. I'm not sure if it's out in the US yet. Well, that's the problem. It's not, be, it's uh, COVID has, uh, has, has hurt us. They were very, well, they were lucky in the first aspect. It took them two years to make the documentary and it cost quite a few million dollars as well. It was an Australian film crew. Mm. And they just got home to Melbourne, lock, stock, and all the excess baggage of stuff they took from my house and settled down in the studio outside of Melbourne to do the big edit and put the whole show together Mm. as COVID hit. So they were actually, well, the producer was going to work on his bike and he had to stay completely separate from everybody else and started making the film. Now, it came out... And they did a great job in Australia. Well, it, it was Australian backing that produced the film, so they, they went out there. Oh, the reviews were just made me cry. But the things people said were, were just so gratifying. I just felt really honoured indeed. And it is a good, it's not just about cyclists. Let's say the normal human being can watch the show as mm, well. Mm. The animal aspect is there, of course. We lost Paul Sherwin uh, as the film is almost being made and after 33 years. So he's in the film as well. And so we cover his unfortunate death. So Australia got the lot and they just took it so well. Then New Zealand followed and they put it into New Zealand. Mm. Then we tried to move it to England. We had two premiere dates in the centre of London, in the West End, at the Odeon Cinema, which is where, <laughs> I laugh at this, all the film stars get the show there first. <laughs> uh, and it was all set up. 
and it, almost the day before it was pulled by COVID on two occasions. So oh. it's never got to England yet. Oh, it hasn't? No, it has not been seen in England. Oh, what a shame. People you who know me, and it's cost me a fortune in beer to show them on my, on my TV. So I've got a copy <laughs> of the film. But however, I am doing a, a few little private jobs, yes. and we're hoping to do a few in the States. But it, we have now got another distributor who seems to have the contacts. Ideally, I'd like to see it pumped out just before the Tour de France on American television. So uh, I'm sure they will. There's a lot about American TV in it, and how I, cause I'm, in fairness, American TV kind of discovered me when I started working with them in the mid '80s, mm. and then uh, it was the Americans who wanted me to start commentating on downhill skiing, alpine skiing, and ski jumping, and I won awards for that. And it was those guys who got me there. By the way, you said I've only done 14 Olympics. I've done 16 now. Oh, come on, Greg. Do your because, homework, mate. I'm, I'm incredibly yeah, yeah, embarrassed, Phil. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely a disgrace. I'm sorry, mate. Oh, dear. My statistics are so long now, I forget them myself, so I can't <laughs> complain to anybody. But I'm, the other, I'm married to Trish for 51 years next week. I must remember that. Huge kind of congrats, I, mate. I keep forgetting it. That, that 51 years. My goodness. It's ridiculous. I, it, it doesn't feel like last week. Yeah. Well, that's because Trish and I never got on. But, you know, it's unbelievable. <laughs> well, you haven't seen each other for 50, 50 of well, those years. COVID's brought you together. It's almost it's like you're changed, having your honeymoon. Changed, you see, <laughs> two years back at the house, um, I know that all Trisha's girlfriends have been saying, well, how's he doing? How is he? Because he's not, he doesn't go away now. How are you getting on in there? And Trisha gives some answers like, well, he's all right, but he, there are mo- we have our moments. Um, because <laughs> Every relationship does. Out. See, Trisha's remained a very much a sports person. She's very fit. She dances every day of her life. Uh, life has not changed because I come home and want some dinner. But we still live our same lives, in you know, honesty, but we still do things together big time. Well, I just want to talk about that documentary one last bit. And when it does come out, listeners, go check it out because it is, it's as much a, a journey of your life as it is a journey of cycling for the past 50 years. It, it, yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, and the rhinos and, and everything that you're doing in South Africa is front and center. Paul Sherwin, and it's, just a very special it's a connection that you two had and it's a great story that just remembers Paul and and you there's more to it than just simply following you know your life it's the way you impacted the things that you have been have surrounded you I thoroughly enjoyed it so um, everybody there's so many good things out there Greg it, it, sometimes if you find yourself in a privileged position to do something about them to the better then my attitude is let's do it Mm. Um, I'm at the end of life now where I don't sound sound very morbid there I don't quite mean it as it sounds but you know I've had a good career and I've made money and I'm happy to give it away if it's to the right places Mm -hmm. and what I tried to do when this show went out in Australia they hired cinemas whoever was doing it and I by the way I never made a penny there was no money in this for me this was a film my life and that was enough for me Mm. but everybody else is due their money back so when they put it on this cinema in uh, melbourne i think it was and i used to when the when the filmmakers sent me a, a note i i did a, an envision video and i put it over to them and they they put it on the front of the show saying welcome little bit of history how the film was made only for two minutes and now sit back enjoy the film and then at the end uh, that somebody at the cinema would say don't leave everybody because Phil Liggett's coming on live now. We thought you might like to speak to him as a Q&A for 30 minutes. Mm. And so the audience stopped leaving and I could now see the audience and I was in my kitchen in London. And of course the time difference meant I was probably rather late as well or early, whichever the way it was. <laughs> and so I did a QA, and a and the third person to stand up and uh, give a question was a New Zealand guy. Um, very difficult to tell the difference to us commoners with the accent, but he was <laughs> from uh, Auckland. And he just simply said, he said, Phil, he said, um, I've always uh, enjoyed your commentary, but I, I now am full of admiration for what you're doing for the wildlife of the world. He said, I'd like to give you $10,000. And I, because the line was great for me to them, apparently, but it wasn't so good from them to me. So I said, I'm sorry, did you say you want to give me $10,000? <laughs> he goes, yes. I said, somebody in the audience, get that man's name. And give them my email address. So that was handled. Within a week, he'd sent me $10,000. Mm. And it was full of praise. And we, I told him where it was going. It was going to the, to the Rhino mm-hmm. and to two certain parts of South Africa. 
And I turned that money around. I had him send it to me here because foreign currency into South Africa is a problem. And I got the money out of my account in South Africa and sent it to the two venues I wanted. Uh, they were over the moon mm. because desperate in COVID. The, the anti-poaching units, nobody can afford to pay them. Uh, you know, they've got to earn a living and they couldn't go around and check out in the middle of the night with the rhinos, etc. The rhinos were in danger. Anyway, the success story is both the venues I gave that money to have not lost a rhino during this two years of the COVID. Not wow. one. Wow. So that guy became, his name is Mark. I won't tell you any more about him, but we are due to meet again soon, uh, somewhere around the world, because our paths will cross. And he's, he's full of ideas. And my hat goes off to him. Firstly, a big shout out to Mark. Yes. Secondly, if people do want to donate, uh, it's helping rhinos is... Is that where they go? Yeah, there are two now because we're also building a school for young women uh, to, who can learn the basics of life, like cooking and sewing. Mm. In the Karamoja area of Uganda, the reason Paul Sherwin lived there, he loved those people. He could speak the language fluently, <laughs> and they looked up to him as someone very, very special in their lives. Every one of them attended Paul's funeral. And we've, we've formed the Paul Sherwin Project, which is simply that, Paul Sherwin Project, dot uh, com mm -hmm. and you can read all about it but the first bricks have arrived because we sent them sixty five thousand dollars recently all given by cyclists and we, we've got a target now of 130,000 to finish the project off and we promise we will get that money for them this year we're on the way so uh, at the moment i think i'd like to see that project finish if anybody is so inclined and I never beg of anybody and understand completely. But if they were to put any money in, please check out the Paul Sherwen, W-E-N, the Paul Sherwin Project dot com. And there's a donate button on it. Perfect. And every penny goes to them. We have a wonderful board of really senior people in the world of cycling. And, of course, Paul's wife, Catherine, uh, who is like like most of us has never recovered from the loss of Paul. He died of a heart failure. He just never woke up. wasn't expected. Sixty two. Sixty two is way too young. Uh, and it was a tragedy. Yeah, absolute tragedy. We're going to have this building finished this year, and there'll be a little plate on it with Paul's name on, and the people will be so they're just so grateful. I've, I've, we've spoken to them. They come on, you know. To talk to this lady called Florence, who's in charge of the project, you listen to her two minutes, you'll be in tears and you'll want to give you a bank account. She's that sort of person. She's just fantastic. I love it. I love it, Phil. Well, I'll put that in the show notes as well um, so people can easily donate. Well, that's very kind uh, of you, Greg. Oh, of that wasn't course, why mate. we were talking to each other. I was just no, of course, of course. Opportune. I don't like... Uh, I hate asking for money to be no, absolutely but, but honest. I'd rather give it myself and say nothing. <laughs> when, when the when the purpose and the reason uh, you know align, I think that's I think it's wonderful. You know, we are living a life of luxury in modern America, modern UK. Yeah. To what's happening around the world now, it's when we watch what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, Trish and I just just tears. Mm. How at minus seven degrees. And these people are living in dugouts. It's just unthinkable. Yeah. Anyway, let's not get on to that side of life. No, it's well, a happy well, interview. No, it's, no, but it's it's okay to recognise things around us. I think at the, at I, the end I of the agree. day, I agree. what we're actually saying is we're incredibly grateful for what we have and, and we all should be I never forget grateful it. and I'm, thankful. It with my very job. Mm. I, I, you know, I, as I said earlier, I've earned a lot of money doing this job. Mm. In the, I started commentating in 78. I started working as a journalist leading to commentary in 1967. At the time, I was really wanting to be a cyclist uh, and was making very good progress. But I, I took this job not knowing where it would take me. Mm. But it took me to the very top of my profession. But on the way, I met so many great people who have been so helpful to doing everything. And I've always laughed with Trish. When I got my first paycheck from the BBC in the late 60s, they paid me. I said, look at this. They've just paid me £15, which these days is about, I don't know, $25. They just paid me $25 to give them 30 seconds and talk about cycling. Yeah. Nobody's interested in cycling. Uh, but how the world changed? And, of course, I managed to tear, turn my hobby into my life. Well, you're and, a big uh, part of no how, how the world, world changed and their views on cycling. It, it, became, it was fairly European-dominated and, and not a lot of English-speaking. And 
Not at all. To have someone like yourself present it to the rest of us and the rest of the world, you really were the catalyst to get cycling out of Europe and to the rest of the world. And I was very happy in that respect. I actually was the first guy to bring a team of American cyclists as a, as an, a USA team to the to the UK Tour of Britain, which I was the organiser of. That's right, yes. I had a plaintive call from a guy called Carl Barton, who was a Brit, but he was the top man in Rally Boston in the USA. And uh, he rang, he said, Phil, I want you to accept, would would I consider accepting an American national team for the Tour of Britain? And I said, Carl, I'd love to, mate, but they're no good. (laughs) And, (laughs) And it was going to cost me a lot of money. He says, I promise you, if you take the team, Everyone will finish the course. And they did. Hmm. And what's more, there were good bike riders, real good people like John Ellis and Mike Howard. Jim Okovich came later. Jim became the manager and owner of the 7-Eleven team that went to the Tour de France. Hmm. Uh, Christian van der Velde was one of his riders, as was Bob Roll, etc. Hmm. So the Americans were starting. Hmm. Within the, I think it was uh, 1983, they had the winner of the milk race which surprised them as much as it did anybody else. But nonetheless, Matt Eaton won the milk race. That's what the Tour of Britain was called. You were the race organiser for that as well, weren't you? The milk yes, race no, the- well, yes, the milk race. We called it a milk race. Not everybody remembers it. I was the yeah. director of the race for 22 years. Mm. Yeah. That's right. While at the same time doing everything else. But uh, I was lucky. You see, I was a pioneer in, in every way without trying. I just did it because I wanted to do it, not because I had ambition to succeed and take over the world of cycling, I became the youngest guy to become an international referee with top marks. I did it because I felt it would help me be the director of the milk race, not because I had ambitions to be going to the Olympic Games as a race commissaire. And I was I, re- I did the world championships as well as a commissaire, but nobody else could do it. Nobody else was there to do it, and I just was lucky enough. I innocently took it on board with both hands, with no ambition to be any more than myself. It's, I, I love that... Um where your passion can take you, right? I mean, yes. I want to refer to any question where you've been on there answering so many wonderful questions and your answers have been just phenomenal. And I love just rewinding the <laughs> clock a little bit where you talk about your PE teacher calling, yeah. calling you a, use, <laughs> a useless a athlete. <laughs> <laughs> a useless His name athlete. Mr. Partington. Yeah. He was well gone now, but he, he was... Uh, he was a fit little ba- little man, and and he came up to me and he said, uh, I, "I said I, I can't do, I can't swim, sir." He says, "Just get out of my sight." He says, "You're absolutely useless." He said, "Go, go and have a b- ride on your bike for forty five minutes, which was the length of the period, and then come back." So I actually got to leave the school on my bike for forty five minutes and come back, which is what I did. Yeah. But at the end of the the time I was at the school, and I was coming up eighteen years of age, time to move on exam results time. They altered the prize for English. Uh, so they gave me Shakespeare's book as the English prize because I, I beat the golden boy in English. Wow. Now that was another piece of luck. I, I had to write an essay on crustacean of the sea, which I loved all that. Mm. So well, I just wrote it, I could have written for a week. Then I had to write another article on locomotives, steam locomotives. I'm a complete nutter on trains. <laughs> so I wrote that and then just answered the usual grammar questions. That wasn't a problem. All of a sudden, I was the best. And I was never showing any signs of being the best. Uh, but then Mr. Partington came up to me that day and signed the inside of that book. And he, he signed it. He said, one day, I'll see you in the Tour de France. Uh, all of a sudden, we were the best of friends because he knew I was doing quite well on the bike and I didn't go around telling him he must have found out. Hmm. Um, but I, I do laugh when I think, well, he was right, but he didn't expect me to do 50 tours to France and not win one of them. <laughs> you, did get, you did get there. I mean, that's the other I part. There. Yeah, that's about where it ended, yeah. <laughs> Just a quick break to remind you to go check out any question. You can go to anyquestion.com forward slash Phil. That's anyquestion.com forward slash Phil and ask him any questions there that you want to follow on from what you're listening to here or listen to some of the answers that he's already done there. Go check it out. I love the when you answered a question, I can't remember exact wording of the question, but something about what was your best career failure or something and, and you oh, yeah. and basically how wanting to be a professional cyclist and yeah. then kind of finding journalism was the ultimate 
you know, career failure, if you like, because you wanted a career as a professional athlete and a young Eddie Merckx had something to do with that, didn't he? <laughs> he did indeed. Uh, Eddie, we weren't friends then, uh, but we certainly became friends later and we are friends now, very much so. I admire Eddie beyond belief as my finest athlete. Mm. But, uh, yeah, what happened was I... I, I think I bumble my way through life the more I start recalling these tales to you, Greg. But <laughs> the thing was that I was racing in, in the UK and for the club on Merseyside. And we had the best cyclists on Merseyside. That's undisputable at the time. Uh, they always said if you won the, the Tuesday night training bash, you'd ride for England. And, you know, I would be in a bunch of maybe 50 guys and 30 of those guys would have already have ridden for England because we were, they were all being picked from the area where we lived. We were the best. I wanted to be, I decided I was quite good at cycling, so I, I went to Belgium. But on the way to going to Belgium, I started writing the club news report for the two local newspapers, the Birkenhead News and the Bebbington News, for nothing. But I wanted to see the guys who had ridden at the weekends get their just desserts in the papers. I kept all the cuttings, of course. Then I went to live in Belgium to try and make it as a pro, and I started racing there, and I realised that there was quite a few good guys there. Americans were there. The odd Aussie came up. There was all the Brits. We were living in little houses, rammed in there because we had no money, and racing. And there was no, we were riding big races. And nobody in the magazines in England were writing about the exploits of these guys, and that annoyed me. So I rang the magazine up. I said, hey, we've got all these guys out here, and, and Tommy Simpson was a world champion mm. uh, for the pros, and nobody was writing about all these races. So we can't do that. We've got no money to have a reporter out there full time. They do an odd report for us. So I did. I did the odd report, which led to every Sunday night sitting in St. Peter's Station in Ghent, uh, where I was living just down the road, putting in a reverse charge call to London, which took two hours to return so I could make the, have the talk. <laughs> and I used to dictate a story every Sunday night. And they paid me, which was pretty useful out there because I had no money. I did that for the whole time I was living in Belgium. And then I went home. And I got my pro contract. I was going back the following year. And that was life was good. I wasn't, I didn't have any money, but I could ride a bike and I was doing what I wanted to do. And so I went down to a, a local factory in a village called Port Sunlight Village, a village that was built by Lord Levy Hume for all his employee, employees. I went into the personal office and said, hey, uh, my name's Phil Liggett and I've got three uncles work for you. And between them, I've logged 160 years service and I want a part-time job. The personnel manager looked at me and said, what? He said, well, who are, the, who are your uncles? I told him, checked him. He said, you're right. I said, yeah. He said, okay. What do you want to do? I said, I'll do anything. I'd like to carry churns, milk churns, because it's milk sim, because that will strengthen my back. I'll do anything you like. So I finished up doing carrying milk churns, humping sugar, and serving at the banquets, you know, sending the stuff through from the kitchen to the tables. Well, during that period of time, the magazine rang me up as I was preparing to go back to Belgium and said, hey, come down for an interview. We've got a vacancy. I said, what? And so I went to London where I'd never been in my life when I was 23. Hmm. And mum said, what are you going down there for? Because they're all southerners down there. <laughs> they're only 300k away, but the north and the south, never the twain shall meet. Yeah. It's pretty similar now. <laughs> and so I went down, a lovely interview, loved everybody. Uh, and they can get the job. But the guy they get the job to happened to have more experience on the newspaper than I had none. And he left within two months. So I got the phone call. And the phone call said it was Friday lunchtime, one o'clock in the day, never forget it, 1967. And the editor said, Phil, Nigel's left. If you're here at eight o'clock, Monday morning, at your desk in Fleet Street, you got the job. There's no more interviews. If you're not there, we understand. That was Friday. I went home, said to my mum, I think I'm going to London, mum. That's when she said, you, don't, you can't <laughs> go down there. It's full of Southerners. So I said, well, I'll, I'll be back next week. And that was in uh, March 1967, and I never went back. Uh, and I got the job, and I, again, I followed my nose. I had no ambition to be a journalist. I just wrote because nobody else wrote. And then as I got there, I started to commentate. I went to bicycle races as a journalist, reporting them. First of all, I was riding the bike races. The editor said to me, he said, now look, I know you're still racing your bike, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's good to have a cyclist on the staff. The deal is you can ride only the biggest races of the weekend 
because that's where the biggest riders are and you can write about it at the same time. And the problem is on the Sunday night, we had to go back to the office in Fleet Street because the paper went to bed and printed the next day, Monday. So I rode the biggest races, but they were often 300 kilometers away and I had to get back home, write the story. And I was finished up sleeping on the mailbags, getting up at six o'clock Monday morning to make sure the paper was sent down correctly. And then when I was in the race, I mean, I was knackered. These guys were still training like professionals, and I was fitting in long hours at work mm. and trying to train, so I couldn't keep up with these guys. But I got into the break one day, and I still had my friends in the peloton because I wasn't far divorced from racing in the north of England. And I remember that the, the British champion was a guy called Peter Matthews, and he was a funny bugger, but we had some good times together. And I got in this breakaway, and, of course, the usual big thug ugly comes to the back and says, hey, get to the front and do some work. I said, I can't, I'm knackered. He didn't believe me, of course, thought I was waiting for the sprint at the finish. <laughs> and so my mate Pete just dropped to the back, and Peter was much faster than me anyway in the sprint. Pete said to him, leave him alone. He's, he's in the back because he's got a typewriter in his back pocket, <laughs> and he's writing the story about you. So just get up the front and do some work, and don't worry about him. <laughs> and I said, thanks, Pete. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I was got blown away probably. I can't remember the end of the race. Oh, I was going to say, did you come around him at the end? It and all it? true. <laughs> no, I, would, I wouldn't have dared do that. Um, the first one to hit me would have been Peter yeah. because he's a fast sprinter and Peter's actually in the film. He's actually in the film because they found him and, and he's, he's a born comedian. That's awesome. So all the people, all the Beatles people from Liverpool are born comedians. Yeah, so, that, so all of a sudden I was a journalist then I picked up a microphone because nobody was talking to the people in the street, telling them what they were watching. Did it for nothing. All of a sudden, I was a commentator. Then BBC asked me to do radio. All of a sudden, I was a radio reporter. And then uh, after three years, the uh, milk marketing board said, would I consider organizing the milk race? I'd have to leave my job in Fleet Street to do it, but uh, I was only going to be a three-day job. I thought, yeah, sounds great. Biggest thing I'd ever done was a 10-mile time trial in the Birkenhead North End. That was the biggest thing I'd ever organized in my life, a 10-mile, 16-kilometer time trial. Mm -hmm. And here I was organizing the big, one of the biggest amateur cycle races in the world. Some would say it was the biggest. That's awesome. And that was a great success story. And during that, I became a commissaire. Um, and then, sadly, uh, the guy that worked on the milk race as the announcer got killed in a car crash. I was his best mate. We did a couple of early tours together. Mm. And in 1978, when, it, when David got killed, I, the, the ITV television rang me up and said, Phil, if you want the job, we're not advertising it because we know David would have loved you to have been the commentator with him, but we didn't have money for two people. Now it's your chance. What do you think? I said, I don't want anybody to ever think I asked for his job. And they said, well, you didn't and you haven't. So... We're offering it to you. Mm. I said, I'll take it. And that's how life started in television. And so it went on. Never asked for a job. Honestly, I've never asked for a job. This is my first job on leaving school, which was an, being an accountant. That was the only one I applied for. It is just like how the cards fell. You know, it's like, it is totally, it's, it's like fate follow and, nose. and follow your nose. And, you know, there's no post education uh, beyond just diving right into what you love. Well, I wasn't right? educated. Yeah. I mean, I left school because there was no money in my family. I couldn't go to university yeah. because my parents wanted money in the household. Mm. Had no car, nothing. No, it, my bike was my transport. It, it really is just following your nose. Mum always says, you're not like other boys. She never said what she meant by that, but she said, you're not like other boys. And uh, I'd love her to, to know how my life panned out because she knew I was not going to be like other people. Amazing. <laughs> well, you're, you're certainly not. And um, <laughs> l l let's move forward a little bit because um, one of my favorite stories that you've shared before, and, and you did share it on any question when somebody asked, you know, what was the mm -hmm. highlight of your career? There's some good questions on there. I've been, I've been very full of trepidation when I've been pressing the answer button because these guys were asking, and girls were asking me some amazingly well thought out questions. Well, that, well that's the thing. I, I'm enjoying it. I'll be honest, Greg, I'm enjoying it. Well, mate, I, I, it's it's so wonderful to have you on the, on the app answering questions, and we have Lydia Jacoby, who's seventeen and a gold medal yeah. swimmer. We have yourself and Frank Shorter, you know, um, yep. America's finest marathoner in history, on the older, slightly older end of the spectrum. And it's nice to just have yep. the the full spectrum of wisdom coming from the great thought leaders of the world. And so we we feel very fortunate that you're on there answering questions. But I love the one where you. 
you describe the highlight of your career, and I know mm. it's the 89 call with um, Greg yes, LeMond and, and Finn Yong, and, and yeah. just – so take me through that, and I love the little bit of what the producer says to you after you're getting your prediction completely wrong. <laughs> you remember the story. It was 89 at all. It was the big return of Greg LeMond, of course, so, and Greg had to really find a contract uh, in 89 because he was, you know, his shooting accent after he won the Tour de France in 86. Mm. So 87 uh, saw Stephen Roach win and 88 Pedro Delgado, and 89 LeMond was back, and boy, he never came back believing he was going to win the race. Uh, but by that period of time, Greg and I had sort of blended a reasonable friendship, uh, but he, and he wasn't thinking of winning the Tour. However, once life got going and, and he started to look like it, he got on the team and he came to the start. Now, when the race started to ride really well, all of a sudden Greg was there. And so too, of course, with Laurent Fignon, he's twice a winner of the Tour at the time. Mm. And Fignon was going to be the favourite all the time. But it was one of those tours. There were never more than, a, well, at one stage it stretched out to just over a minute, if I remember rightly, but most of the battle was one-on-one. -on -one. Greg would take the yellow jersey, so Fignon would go and take it back. Greg would win a stage, so Fignon would go and win a stage. And then towards the last week of the tour, it was Fignon in yellow. When the riders came down to uh, Chambéry, mm -hmm. Chambéry, no, Aix-en-Provence, mm. Can't remember now. I've, I've anyway, trained in Aix-en-Provence. I know yeah, that. Yeah, well, well, it's by yeah. the lake, isn't yeah, it? They, yeah, come down, beautiful. they came down this hill off the mountains, the yeah. five leaders, and they all fell off at the roundabout, turning for the finish. They all got back up and they all crossed the finishing line. That was two days before the Tour de France finished in Paris. Hmm. Now, at the time, Fignon was in yellow, but the man that won the stage that day was Greg Lamond. The man that finished second was um, Laurent Fignon. The man that finished third was Pedro Delgado. Fourth, I can't remember who was fourth. I think it was La Jaleta, Marino La Jaleta. Anyway, the first five riders in the same order as they, 48 hours later, would finish the Tour de France. Wow. That was not noticed by anybody, except when I started looking at facts after the race was over. So we got down to the Palace of Versailles, 24-kilometre time trial. I remember it was a lovely day. Paul and I stood outside that magnificent palace at nine o'clock in the morning and did a piece to camera. Paul was pretty much a rookie at the time because mm -hmm. he'd only been with me two or three tours and we'd known each other for quite some time. And so I looked at the camera, introduced the Tour de France coverage, uh, said, let's have a look at the overall standings. Well, there we are. Laurent Fignon is leading the tour 50 seconds ahead going into the last day. It's only a short time trial. Paul is going to win this tour because Greg Lemond's in second place which in itself was a brilliant story. I mean, you'd have been happy to finish second, having been shot almost dying mm. only two years earlier. And so Paul looked at the camera and said, well, he said, it can't be anybody but Laurent because Laurent's a great time trial rider, which he was. He's a Frenchman, which he was. Uh, he lived in Paris, which he did. And uh, he's got 50 seconds in hand. I looked at the camera and said, well, I think Greg Lamont's going to win the tour. And I reckon he'll probably win by six seconds. So we stopped the tape. That was taped. And we sent the tape by satellite to London to be put on the, on the front of the live show. Mm. So the recording was on the front of the live show. And uh, then Paul and I got in the car. And we were driving nicely towards Paris for a cup of coffee on the Champs-Élysées. And we had about four hours to kill before we started work on the, uh, on the, on the time trial. And so Paul said, what do you say that for? I said, look, of course, of course Fignon's going to win. I said, but I don't want the viewers turning off before, before the race starts. <laughs> yeah, you've got so to let's, create it. let's make a bit of suspense. I said, and if Greg Lamont wins this race, Paul, it's not going to be by very much, is it? Yeah. He's already 50 seconds behind. Oh, and so that's how he left it. Well, Paul was always good and loved figures. And he had got this time trial worked out, the gains required and what it was going to take. And so when we started commentary, I, the next day, by the way, I advised Paul, I said, you were so good on that commentary yesterday. You want my honesty? Retire now because you won't be any better. Uh, That's what the next day. Now we're back to the ride. So we all get in position and we're calling it out nicely. And then Paul, we're waiting for the big start. Last, second last to start, obviously, Greg LeMond. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the tri bars on, which really... Uh, that was the first time, right, they'd been seen? In the tour yes, of it was, yes, but yes. he had a one piece. To, he had a, he had the tri bars which had been approved, mm. and Fignon had not, for some reason, tried to get his approved. It's a very complicated tale. Mm. Anyway, Fignon came last, so he's about two minutes. I think he would have been on the start behind Greg. Mm -hmm. 
So we were watching uh, watching the goal. Paul was calling it. We were trying to get our best gains. Paul had his own stopwatch going. He was reckoning that Finon had to make this gain of around 1.2 seconds, uh, slightly less, whatever it was, for the kilometres. And uh, no, 1.5 1. 1. seconds, it was 24 kilometres, and it was 50 seconds down. Mm-hmm. And he was doing it. And Paul was calling it spot on. I, was, I kept thinking when I was calling, gee, I hope, I hope he's not making a mess of this because he's... He's, he's so confident he's calling it right. I had to go with him because we're live, <laughs> you see. But he, he, he was the most brilliant, accurate call he ever did in his life. Yeah. But then when Le Mans came down from the Arc de Triomphe down to the finishing line, crossed the line, he had a time on the board. So we now knew mm-hmm. exactly what Fignon must do to cross that finishing line to win the Tour de France. And here is Paul calling with 5K to go. He's only five seconds to the good or whatever it was. And then at the finishing line, we got past the 250. And it was around 220, 230 meters from memory. The clock went past the time set by Greg LeMond Mm -hmm. required to win the tour. And it took him eight seconds, Fignon, to get to that line. And I said, I don't believe this. This was live to the audience, of course. I said, but Greg LeMond has just won the Tour de France by eight seconds. And the producer in London, who was a a grisly guy, who was a real top man, so well-known in television that everybody saluted him, just put the key across in my right ear and said, next time, Liggett, get it bloody right. (laughs) Well, that cracked me. I burst into tears. And I had Greg LeMond jumping for joy and tears pouring down his face with Cathy on my left. I had Paul on opinion, literally at my feet, curled up like a fetus on the floor crying. And there was me crying, trying to look at them both. (laughs) It it was a bizarre scene. But it was wonderful. Was that the last time they finished with a a time trial? And yes, it was. Fans. I don't think they've got the nerve to ever do it again. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's great TV from what you're painting, I think. Well, well uh, it was as it worked out, but now yeah. it, I, it'll never happen again. I don't think they'll ever finish with a, with a time trial again. Yeah, 89 was the last time they did finish. Greg was, was rightly surprised, but it had been that sort of tour. Mm. And the, don't forget, the first five riders to be the final overall was the same five riders who crossed in that very order two days earlier in Aix-en-Provence. It was just unbelievable. Everything was unbelievable about the whole thing. I love that. I love that story. I love the way you tell it. <laughs> uh, it's very, you can picture it, you can see it, and you can feel I'm it. I'm talking so. to some scientists in South Africa in Peter Maritzburg. Um, in April, I'm going to tell them that story. Now you like it, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now you're someone you you do you you. I remember sitting next to you even in Slovakia. You, you love your note taking. You take a lot of notes, and and you I do. You really are fastidious in the way you prepare. You know the athletes. Again, I, I heard you sort of talking about your note taking on any question, and there was the. Eric Zabel, yes, and getting yes. the happy birthday right on the finish. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, that was in Charleroi when the race came into Belgium. Yeah, Eric was the was the sprinter of the time. He was holding the record of green jerseys in the tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, he became a friend too, by the way, because he liked Trish. Yeah, um, that's another story. We met him. complete. I was sat in a restaurant on on the seafront in Cape Town, and Eric was there with Jan Ulrich and the team. They they just gone to Africa to go training by themselves. And at the end of the meal, we'd never spoken. I saw him over there. I wasn't going to go over the whole team. We, in the sort of Hollywood in the corner. Eric came over and just said, Phil, I just want to say hello to your lovely wife. Just, and I didn't really know Eric. I said, well, be my guest, Eric. That, that, he was such a gentleman. Since then, Eric has become a, a, a great friend. Mm-hmm. That's an aside. Eric was celebrating his birthday at the time. And the, the whole point of it, we were always conscious, and I drill this into Paul. I said to Paul, we're not cyclists. Neither are the people watching our program. So don't, uh, don't talk down to the viewer, but educate them so they can enjoy what they see. That's what we, I decided we would do. I said, now today is Eric Zabel's birthday. It's a perfect stage for him to win. And if he wins on his birthday, we've got a great story. So what we decided to do with that day was to keep the viewer's eye focused on Zabel's position in the peloton. And in the last 20K or so, we took the viewer into that peloton, constantly showing where Zabel was moving to, where the wind was changing direction, how clever he was to get his team here. So uh, I thought, if, if we cock this up, I was thinking to myself, we're going to write idiots, but anyway, we'll do it. 
And as we were coming through to Charleroi, Eric got himself with his lead-out boys in perfect position. The finish was a formality down this long, straight Charleroi. is a beautiful Belgian city with a lovely cathedral in the backdrop. Here comes uh, Eric Zabel. He hits the line, puts his hands in the air, and my final words was, <laughs> happy birthday, Eric. <laughs> and I thought, um, well done, Liggett and Sherwin, because you got it right. You got but it I didn't say that. No. <laughs> <laughs> high five. At least you're probably doing those little high fives in the booth or little fist bumps or whatever. We, we, did, we got we that did. one right. It was just so perfect. And I've told Eric that story since. I've yeah. told him at the function since. Yeah. yeah I, you, you also mentioned that, you actually don't think you're talented. You're just having fun. Exactly. What do you mean by that? You, you, well, you so just... When I listened to myself back maybe two years later, I said, where the hell did I get that fact from? Because <laughs> I've forgotten it now. And I just can't. It's, it's like when I'm ski jumping or, or downhill skiing. I look at the tapes very rarely, by the way, very rarely, but people tend to dig them out and send them to me. But um, I said, bloody hell, that's, that was a nice piece of information. I wonder how I did that because it's, it's not premeditated. It's like my ligatisms. People call them ligatisms. I did and they did. Uh, I mean, I just look at the picture and, and write the script to suit the picture because with CBS, we always wrote scripts mm. and they had to be perfect. I, I talked about the roller coaster of pain and that was just because we were riding up and down on the cobblestones in the Paris-Roubaix. <laughs> and the American producer thought, that's, that's great, man, that's great. Yeah. Use it. I, I, so that's just what the television told. But people think I sat at home writing all these down. No, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and no, f- nothing was further from the truth. I didn't know I was going to say them until I said them. Yeah. I had no premeditation about anything. Um, and because they have the Liggett and Show in bingo in, for set phrases, you could get it on the internet and people crossed off the phrase if we said it until they, until they won a line on bingo. <laughs> Well, there's, they didn't know how, how lucky they were if they got the same phrase twice. The, the, the one that probably makes stands out is when I, I still use dancing on the pedals, mm. but it was really done for, for uh, Pedro Delgado in his day as a great mountain climber all those years ago in the 80s. Um, and I, I called uh, Mark Cavendish for the first time. It was me that gave him the nickname The Manx Missile, and he's just been fired because... I, I didn't go to the board saying I'm going to call Mark Cavendish the Manx Missile. That's what it looked like. He left that peloton so fast, I just said the missile's been launched or something like that. Of course, everybody else claims it title now, but it was me that gave him that title. How much of it is you and Paul just having such a strong mateship that you end up just, <laughs> you're having so much fun together, together that these things just... Yeah pop up you know when you when you're at the bar with your mates and you're just having a bit of a yarn it's amazing what comes out of your mouth how much of it is that kind of a thing well for me virtually everything because i sometimes see paul look at me but he can't speak and thinking what the hell are you talking about no <laughs> i'm going to see his expression paul was a fast learner very yeah. intelligent guy yeah he studied newspaper technology funnily enough which he never used at manchester university he got his education and then immediately the next day packed his bags, went to France for 10 years, became a very, very good professional bike rider. Mm. So he was he was clever. Now when I made the offer to him in 85 to say, I hear you're retiring, Paul. How do you fancy working with me? He simply said, I'll give it a go. Yeah. But, you know, because I was working with American TV, which he wasn't, when I took him on board, he was only with the English TV. The Americans got to like him as well, and they integrated him with me on American TV. And Paul learned very quickly how to write scripts because he had no clue how to write scripts. So, because writing a book and writing a script are two very different so, things. So, hang on, when you say writing a script, you have an outline well, it, for the day, or no, no, American TV didn't do live television. They're always oh. afraid. They like that delay button in case you swear or something, so they yeah, get it out. Yeah, yeah. So this way, it's changed now. Yeah. But this now in those days, they would every three days they would give me a finished film of what's going to be seen on Saturday. Oh, on that's CBS. way harder, isn't it? Oh. It, it is. And oh, I would have to work, work through the night to write the script yeah. because I'm working all the day on the tour. And then gradually, Paul came in. So you keep on press go, press go, rewind, press go watching what they're giving you, oh. which is silent movie, and you literally write the script. So when a guy, and he punched him on the nose, you've got to have that line exactly on the time code when he punched him on the nose. <laughs> and so it's much different to writing a book. Oh. But Paul learned how to do it, and he wrote some very good scripts after that. He learned literally how to write, 
and we just blended so well. We yeah. never, ever fell out. We laughed. For the first 10 years, we shared a bedroom because we wanted to, because cyclists always shared rooms. There's the, all these girls booking our hotels for CBS and for ESPN, and I insisted that we shared the same room. Talent doesn't share rooms. They have a suite upstairs. And so I said, no, no, we've got to be in the same room. They probably thought there was other things going on, but of course nothing was further from the truth. We used to go to bed laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple yeah, of nights and you're away. tell me stories of life in the peloton after 10 years to the, doing the Tour de France, and I learned things I thought I knew everything. I know half of it after Paul told me about his mates and his, his personality kept you going. If the morale gets bad, that's how he kept. So despite his music. Oh, his music guy. <laughs> he, well, he, and he plays it all the time. <laughs> Funny enough, I'll drive for 10 hours and I won't put any radio on at all. Mm. I, I just let my bro- I'm, I'm thinking all the time, but I'm not interested in listening to music. Yeah. Anyway, we got rid of those when they blew us up in Spain. I love it. They <laughs> blew, <you>, blew your <laughs> car up and they got rid of all the, uh, yeah, all the tapes. And it wasn't our car either, so there's a bonus to everything. Yeah. So. <laughs> I love that. Some of those stories are phenomenal. And they are all uh, in your documentary, but I... Um, they, they are, they, yeah, they are. It, it's, it's, it's a story of life, really, I think, my documentary. It's not somebody who doesn't understand saying, oh, I'm not watching that. Beyond oh, no, 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 no. Like this. No. And that's not, it's not what it is. It's about, no, it's about it's passion and, and interest. Trish and, and I both yeah. cried when we saw it. We couldn't believe anybody would want to make a story of my life I to love, start I with. love that Trish was throughout the documentary too, by the way. Yeah, I she think got, well, was, she wasn't in the beginning, but yeah. when the guys came to, to do the documentary, the first time they came on location, we were in South Africa. Yeah. And they came, they saw the deck, they saw the house, they started saying, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Then they saw the discussion I was having with Rangers about what we can do about the poaching and stuff. Then they saw how involved Trish and I were together. They threw the script away. They yeah. rewrote the whole show. Is that right? Simple yeah. as that. Yeah. yeah. No, the whole show. I, I did like that. I love the, the partnership that you guys have had, you know, through thick and no, so thin. She's and silly so. and she's dancing with the elephants. Yeah, she in, is dancing the with the elephants on the deck. Oh, my there. goodness, yeah. me. Lost, said, the plot, lost the plot, Lost the plot. If you grab <laughs> you out of that trunk, you'll be on the roof of the house in 30 seconds, in three <laughs> seconds flat, rather. Uh, uh, you were yeah. asked um, the greatest athletes of all time and yeah. the three top greatest athletes of all time. And I, and I like this answer because... Well, you can take me through them uh, if you mm. remember them, but you put them on any question. I can give you a lead if you don't remember. But the number one was obvious, Eddie Merckx. Yeah, Eddie Merckx, yeah. 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 Number two, you had... There was one, this isn't the same as the one about my three famous people, was it? No, 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 That's this is a different question. one. And okay, you said well, yeah. Mark Allen and then Hussein Bolt. Yeah. And I thought to yeah. have Mark Allen in yeah. that mix with those two was, was really see, quite thrilling. I, I was really raw. Mm. on triathlon you might still say i am but i was really raw <laughs> no, no, i not covered at all. a lot of the nice triathlons yeah. which was it's it was down in on the Côte d'Azur. that's yeah. a tough old course for the guys oh, brutal i think mark allen won it 10 years straight at the time he was the eddie Merckx of triathlons and he lived in woods he was the zen man they called him and i sort of got reasonably close to mark because he was always the man that cbs wanted the interview with and we we had sit down interviews in hotel rooms before the iron man and, and I remember him running down on his, it's killing me, but I can't remember the guy he caught. He was a German, but he, he started the last night, last leg, which was the run, of course, eight or nine or 10 minutes behind. Mm-hmm. And he ran him down about five I think, it was, 13, I think it was 13 minutes. And it could be, it could be. The, it's a long oh, time ago. German. My goodness, Greg, come on. He did end up going on to win. Uh, yes, he year, did. Year or two he later, did, but, uh, and he was, oh, he was always there or thereabouts anyway. But the run by Mark, mm. it was like watching a steam train. We had a camera head on to him, and he was puffing and blowing, and he was coming. He was coming. He was coming. Then the camera swung round. There was the man, and he passed him. Brilliant, brilliant athlete. And um, yeah, and my other favourite athlete is Greg Welsh. I've had lots of fun with Greg. Oh, He's Welsh-y. crazy. Yes, I actually he, haven't had Greg Welsh on the the, the show yet. Oh, you got to. Um, you got well, to. I know that. I've, in, I've uh, actually Rensalina, asked him, and he was meant to come on once. About you tell him I I said you got to come on. <laughs> yeah, because Greg and I are we just great. He won Foster Tongue Curry Ironman mm. at the same time. Is soon to be wife won the women's event. Sean. That's right. And uh, I was. Uh, but I was actually there in Foster Tonkari in Australia. And the first to finish, I, I got to Sean. And she was speechless. I said, Sean, you've got to answer the questions, you know? She said, I can't. I can't believe you're talking to me. I said, what? 
<laughs> I said, I, I, I did look special because I had a suit on. I mean, you know, they were very posh in those days, television, suit and a badge. Yeah. And then Greg finishes, and we do Greg as well, who's leaping up in the air. He leapt up and crashed through the tape and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And well, that night, I'll tell you, they both went into the nearest pub. Oh, they enjoy a few pints. They enjoyed a few pints, those guys. Oh, by the way, um, Thomas Hilregel, uh, uh, Hilregel is the... Um, athlete that Mark oh, Allen well ran down done. and well, uh, you, I've been trying to I'm not joking I've been wrestling with this now for some years yes I never bothered to look at Thomas it. but he ended he did end up winning in the late 90s there again probably did, 96 did, 90s did. actually 96 was Luke Van Lee so they were great athletes oh yeah phenomenal Dave Scott Scott Tinley yeah. uh, Mike Pig yeah they were just fabulous people and yeah uh, you're gonna um, the guy Jürgen Zack. Jürgen Zack, yeah. At the time, he set the, the the best time ever seen for the bike ride, 180 kilometer ride. Yeah. He was a bit thick built, but he was a strong boy. Have you seen how fast they're doing it now for this 180k? These guys, it's like it's down to the you know four hours now for the 180k, and they've done a swim before it, and they're running a marathon yeah. after it. I mean. The guys are just getting. I mean, yes, there's a little bit of aerodynamics there, and you know the equipment's a little bit better, but there my, is. my goodness, it's unbelievable. Now, you did mention earlier, just a few minutes ago, um, when I was about to ask you about you know the three greatest ath- athletes of all time, yeah, yeah. and three uh, living people, and I loved your three um, mm-hmm. that you know you would love yeah. to meet if you could or have dinner with, or, yeah. uh, however the question was phrased. Who were those three? Well, the one that I, I've always wanted, well, the two, were Nelson Mandela. I never got to meet him. And uh, Sir David Attenborough, mm-hmm. because of his love for animals and his understanding of why animals are so important to survive. And that if the animals don't survive, it's a guaranteed certainty the human being won't survive. Mm. He's 90, I think he's 95 just now he doesn't live far from me, but I've still never met the man. Is that right? Yeah. He, he sees life as it is and where it's going. And he's such a wise man. Mm. Mandela, well, <laughs> I, I'm only full of full of praise for that man. Mm. How he, he hasn't got a hatred, hated bone in 20, his body. Was it 23 years locked I up on 25. that island? 25 years on that island, yeah. But I did see where he was his final incarceration. I was very privileged. Mm. I was covering a race which finished outside the Jackson prison near Wellington and Paul. And the warden came out, one, one of the chief wardens came out, and he came up to me because he knew I was a journalist. He said, look, he said, um, if you're interested in seeing Mandela's a place where he was incarcerated, uh, I've, I can take you into the prison, which is very much an active prison. There's a lot of lifers in there. And so <laughs> I couldn't get anybody to go because the journalists that were on deadlines for the race, but I said, I would love to come. So he took me and I walked past all these guys that were trying to strangle me as I went past <laughs> the bars. And, uh, and we went way into the, into the bush because what they did with Mandela, they built him a bungalow. This is when he was off Robin Island and now being get ready for being returned to huh. proper life. And so we went to this bungalow, which had a, a swimming pool, and a huge wall. The wall was very high, about four or five meters high, all around his bungalow. Now, he locked himself in at night, and that was for his own safety, uh, oh. because he was never locked in. He wrote his book inside, that's what he did all day long. And the reason they built the wall was because about two kilometers away with these posh cameras, they could climb trees and they could photograph him in the swimming pool or sitting outside doing his writing. (laughs) So they stopped their view. But the guy who was the warden who took me was the man that looked after Nelson. And he said I used to take him out in the car every day and nobody knew he left his his room. (laughs) I would go and I would take him home in the car. I would call for lunch with my parents. Uh, and I wouldn't even tell them he was sat in the car outside. And then he would just take him back to jail. He was just m- making it, getting him used to going out into the public eye again. He was never, ever recognized by anybody because they never knew he was there. Uh, it was a great story. And then, of course, Nelson, uh, the, the, the brilliant Rugby World Cup, uh. Uh, which South Africa won, and Nelson came on stage wearing a rugby uh, jersey. It was just too good to be true. It was fascinating. If the world was full of Nelson Mandela's, We'd be in a happy place. Yeah, fascinating, Absolutely. fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. they, there's two. I mean, they're extraordinary yeah. people. Who's your third? Oh, the Queen. Ah, well, the Queen was very special because she gave me a medal. Yes, I thought somebody was. A, I thought it was a joke when I got this letter from Ten Downing Street, where the Prime Minister lives, and it said, uh, "Mr. Liggett, if you were to receive an award from Her Majesty, would you accept it?" And the reason they say that is because in the seventies. 
the Beatles sent their medals back as a sign of protest, which they regretted later in life, but at the time they got the MBE, which I got, but they sent it back. So now they check you'll take it and save the embarrassment. Uh. So, of course, I said to Trish, somebody's taking the piss here, because it's a very uh, played-down letterhead. It's embossed, just white paper with a white emboss. And if you hold it to the light, you'll see printed through 10 Downing Street, London, SW1, or 11, or whatever it is. And so I thought it was a joke. Then I got to read all the pack paperwork I had to fill out. I said, this can't be a joke. Um, so I filled it all out. They don't tell you the, the exact medal you're getting. They just said an award. So I filled it all out. Back came the reply. I was bound by the code of the secrecy not to reveal it to anybody except close members of the family. But I could expect press calls on and after the Queen's birthday honours list. Mm. And that, that was it. And then, so when I went to the palace six months after that to receive the award, it was very funny. I mean, I'm, I'm in this huge place holding area uh, at the top of the stairs in Buckingham Palace where Trish had been because she went to the Olympic Games and therefore she'd been to the palace. I hadn't been. She knew the way to the ballroom. And then <laughs> we, we, we got upstairs and I just um, found like-minded people. I found one guy I remember who'd been given an award for the British Waterways while I was a great canal enthusiast. He had an earring and a ponytail, and he'd been given a, a, a British Empire medal, I think, for his services to the canal system. He was a great character. Anyway, the, the huge, huge door standing 20 feet high swing open. In walks this man with a red sash on. Morning, everybody. Morning. Nice to see you all. Well, you all must be very famous, otherwise you wouldn't be here. That was his first question, uh, first uh, declaration. Then he comes in and says, right, result. you're going to meet Her Majesty herself today, which is very, very good because she doesn't always do these awards. He says, and I want you all to pay attention because it will make your afternoon far more enjoyable. So I'm going to show you how to curtsy. <laughs> right, so he, he walks up there. He says, imagine I'm you, to the ladies. You turn left here at the carpet. You look straight at Her Majesty, who will be about 50 feet in front of you. You will bow, straighten up, and then walk towards her. She's only a little lady, so don't stand too far away, because she will want to shake your hand. She will offer you her hand. You don't offer yours. Right, got that bit. She will ask you a question. By way of reply, do not give your whole life story. There's <laughs> a lot of people getting awards. Right, got that, yeah. And he says, then you just retrace your footsteps, but go the opposite way, otherwise you'll clog up the corridor and, uh, and get out, basically. And I, now, um, he says, let me just um, tell you that for the ladies, you curtsy by going uh, the right leg in front of the left leg and bowing, or the left leg in front of the right leg. It really doesn't matter, he says. But let me give the ladies a fair warning. Don't go down too low as i known them never to come back. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. So I, I remember all this, and we get to meet the Queen. I, I bow and I walk up to her. I had a top hat and tails and white gloves and all. I had a little paraphernalia, and she put her hand out, and I shook it, and she said, uh, this cycling is getting very popular, isn't it? I said, yes, ma'am, it is. She said, and uh, that was it. So I got off. <laughs> but when I got round the back where they box your medal, the guys there were getting the box ready, and they said, how did you get this job? I said, what? How did you get on television doing cycling? Everybody in, the, in Buck House watches you, you know. I said, what? No, we all love the Tour de France on television. I couldn't believe it. Oh, that's I, so the great. The last people I thought would watch the television was Buckingham Palace. That's fantastic. Thank heavens I've only said nice things. But I, I have to admit... I am a total royalist. I'm very proud of it. Well, well, let's make sure you get a lunch with with the with the Queen, but you know, because <laughs> I've met most of them, but I've never had. Lunch. Well, hey, no, hang on. I did. Um, I did go because I was president of an association. I did attend the Queen's uh, Golden Jubilee. Oh wow! Um, as a special guest with Trish. Yeah. And that was a, an occasion. If a bomb had gone into the tables that day, oh. we had the whole of the government, the whole of the shadow government. We had all of the past prime ministers still living. We had the whole of the royal family on the top table. And there was me and a guy who had just lost his Rolls Royce, had been pinched the morning before. He was from West, East London, from the Barrows. And um, I just met, again, a lot of people. I remember when we were announced by the Pike staff men and banged the Pike on the floor. They're going, Lord and Lady so-and-so, Sir and Madam so-and-so, Mr and Mrs Phil Liggett. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I walk in and I got in there and I said to Trish, I said, I have never been to a function in my life but I've known absolutely no one. Wow. And that was true. That was in 2005, I think. It's, I it's, it's always a bit shaky when that happens. Uh, I love that was, story. Yeah, I met some great I'm a people. bit of a royalist myself. And I, uh, I love it. And I, I mean, that the, the show... Uh, is it called The Crown? I think that did a lot for the Queen and the royal family. I think it people did. now yeah, understand. Trish watched every second of that. I watched most of it. Not only yeah, that. I mean, didn't paint a real great picture of uh, Prince Philip, but it uh, it definitely was. People, if you want to watch a great show, it was a great show on Netflix. I want to just shift gear a little bit because I want to. Yeah. I want to just predictions for for this year's. Tour de France. Um, you know, we're still several months away. We still haven't had a lot of racing for you probably to be able to predict terribly much. A lot of people still are hiding the form, I think. Uh, yeah. uh, young, I'm going to get his name wrong, and you did tell me pre-show. Po- po- <laughs> po- <laughs> it's uh, Teddy Pogaccia. Pogaccia, thanks, mate. Pogaccia. Yeah. I mean, is there, he going for it? A- little V's on the C. Pogaccia. Is he going for a third, do you think? I mean, is he, can anybody beat him? yes. Yeah, yeah. And he could get it, I think. He's riding out of his pants just at this moment in time. Yeah. He would love to win Milan San Remo coming up. Yep. However, I'm not sure it's a race that really suits him down the ground. He's also afraid he can't, he can't shake them all, but we'll see. It's about 20 years since we've had a lone break win there. Mm. He'll be the man to beat because everybody says he's the next Eddie Merckx. I, I hate that phrase. Nobody's the next Eddie Merckx. He'll be the next Tade, maybe. Mm. He is showing to have the similar talents of Merckx in as much that he loves his bike riding, mm. he loves to win, and he races at every opportunity. And they are the most difficult cyclists to beat. He doesn't know when to say no. Mm. Um, that's why I could never get near Eddie Merckx. He was attacking <laughs> from the gun. And, he, you know, everybody believes he can't do this, he can't keep this up, but he could. And so can Taddy Pogaccio. Taddy's fascinating. I was talking with Christian Vanderbilt yes. last week about that. Uh, you know, <laughs> the guy him. the guy has the, the mountain jersey, the, the white jersey, the, exactly. the yellow jersey, never been done before. And he's done exactly. it twice in a row. I mean, it's really quite he's extraordinary. Still young, he still qualifies. Well, he was the youngest winner of the Tour de France since inception, 1904. Mm. Henri Cornet won after a disqualification of the older st- elder statesman. Uh, Pogacar is something else. Mm. And, it's, and it's amazing. Is he still riding for UAE? Or? Yes, he is. And that team is having a stellar start they of the are. season. They are. Uh, yeah. Not least helped by him, but there's others there too. There's an American as well, Brendan McNulty, also mm-hmm. riding mm-hmm. superbly uh, for them and winning. And of course, the accident to Egan Bernal when he hit this bus while he was training on his time trial bike is very serious. And although he's saying he might get back racing soon, if these injuries that were given, then I don't see how he can get, get back racing soon. But on the other hand, his life's far more important than riding a race this year. But we'll see. But he won't get back for the Tour de France. That's, no, no, that's no, 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 no. Way. no that- so that's, that's sad because I think he would have been on a good year this year. There will be challenges, of course there are challenges, uh, not least, um, I, I actually don't know who's riding yet, I haven't read all the things, but Roglic will no doubt feel he's got to ride. Any British, American uh, going for the overall? Or we kind of had our heyday with the Wiggins and Froome. Well, I think the, I think, uh, the Yates is, Adam Yates, yeah. Simon Yates is going for the Giro. Adam Yates might well be heading up now for the Tour. Okay. And yeah. He'll be alongside Carapaz for Ineos. Yeah. Let's see how they shape up in the... Uh, the spring classics yeah. just now. So we're having a full season, which is absolutely fabulous. Although riders have been dropping out uh, like flies with, with the, the common cold now. They don't call it cold. Well, it's not common. Have you had the recent cold? It really does knock you for a six, this new Yes, co- it does. <laughs> and, and bronchitis as well, which yes. is the cyclist nightmare at this yes. time of the year. I'm still Breathing struggling with chest. Airing. I've had like four yeah. of them, I think, this year. It's just constant. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, now we're, and we don't talk. I mean, even though we had 97,000 cases in the UK yesterday, we don't talk about it anymore. No. Nobody talks about it. Oh, it's nice. We're far too busy now with the Ukraine Russia war. Oh, there's always something, uh, mate. It's, there's it's always all something. changed. All right, mate. Well, this is this has been absolutely wonderful just to catch up and chat well, and listen to your stories. To you. I've remembered more things than I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what's next for you? You off off to South Africa for seven yep. weeks in, in the next. Is that in the next week or two? You said yes. We're going on the. Uh, Immediately after Paris Roubaix, I'm doing Paris Roubaix. Yep, but I will, I'm not going to Paris Roubaix. I'll do it from London. Yep, uh, like I did last year, and I I love that race. Oh, yeah. and it'll be on uh, Peacock mm-hmm. in America. Two days after that, it's hot footing then to to Africa, and then we're staying there till the last day of May. 
flying home, and that gives me the whole of June to prepare for the Tour de France because we go to the tour three weeks after that. That's fantastic. And then we're, right? then we're in, uh, we'll be in Denmark. I think it'd be a gr- great race. And of course, history in the making with, it's not really history because we had a women's tour before, but people, people forget the Tour Feminine of the 80s, which That's was the brilliant. 80s. Yes, yes. Um, and was much further and harder probably than the one we're going to see this year. But nonetheless, it's good to see the women have hit the highlights now, all over in every direction in cycling. About bloody time, cycling. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. I absolutely. mean, I've enjoyed mountain biking for years on Red Bull TV. And I got to tell yeah. you, for the most part, I often enjoy the women's racing more than the men's. It's like when you look at Kate Courtney, Yolanda Neff, and and, and these and Paula, uh, Pauline Ferran Prevot, who's won on the road as well, world titles, yeah. and, and watching these women go head to head, it's just been phenomenal racing. Triathlon we've had it for yes, years. It's, women too. it's like, oh. come on, come on, road cycling, get catch back up. <laughs> so it, it well, is we're great. In now, and, and that, that race will start the last day of the Tour de France and race into a very difficult part of France across to the east. Mm. Mm. It'll be a fabulous race up the, uh, the Belle de, de Planche Fille. Oh, it would be fantastic. Oh, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. That, and that's we're the thing. To it, yeah. it'll, it'll just continue to grow. they just got to get the, open that door, get the foot in the door and really help it grow. The only one regret I've got is that uh, I've not been asked to do anything on the World Championships in Wollongong, ah. which is a great shame. What, what, what I don't date? even know who's got the TV right. Yeah, well, when is that? Me. What date is the World Champs in Wollongong? Uh, it's August into September, I think. Oh, mate, you've got to get down there. Yeah, it would have been nice, but I don't think I will be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hopefully, I'd like to get back to Australia at some point. I haven't been back home for I should imagine. quite a few years now. I've got to get well, my mum out. I haven't seen my mum. Everybody's letting though. everybody back in now. Yeah, it's slowly, slowly well, I'm opening up. I'm hoping to be back for the tour down under next year. Yeah, for Christmas at least to be nice. All right, mate. Well, yeah. this has been absolutely a pleasure and a thrill. Well, you know I've me. Really I really enjoyed it, Greg. Very nice of you to think of me again. Of course. And I enjoy these conversations. This is, uh, you know, this kind of a recording or this kind of show is probably less of an interview and more of just a relaxed chat. And I enjoy just. I like those best of all. Yeah. My best speeches come out of questions, honestly. Yeah, they really do. A good question really gets inside me and I can. The pictures all flood forward again. Perfect, mate. Well, thanks for joining me and, and thanks everybody for listening um, and sharing Absolutely. the show. And all the feedback. I hope they've made a couple of cups of tea as well and enjoyed the, <laughs> They're usually out working out, most of my listeners. They're on their bikes and running and, oh, uh, you, you know, people. listening to us I chat. I look at one and now I look at you and you're also fit. I no, love not I me. I do a smart trainer uh, probably twice a week. Oh, no. And I challenge don't. myself because I know I can beat myself. Yeah. <laughs> I can only I can only beat my new self, not my old self. I don't I don't well, like to compare. Yeah. Yes. All right, everybody. Well, you can find all the show notes, timestamps, links, coupon codes at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.